I'm standing in the Barry Rooms, which are the most Victorian part of the National Gallery to, to survive. And these rooms were not as glorious and as splendid uh, in Clark's time as they are today. In fact, they were considered as something uh, of an embarrassment. But Clark put these rooms to amazingly effective use in the middle of the war by staging here Mara Hess's uh, concerts in the gallery, which are probably the thing for which he's best remembered as director. Clark was responsible, of course, for evacuating the gallery in advance of the war. And it was a, it was a brilliant operation. Almost all the pictures were taken from here uh, to North Wales and eventually, of course, secured in slate mines near Blana Festignon. Mara Hess came to him with the suggestion that the concerts might be held in the National Gallery, occasionally, perhaps. And Clark was immediately thought this was a brilliant idea. One of his motives for this may well have been the fact that the government hadn't got round to deciding what it would do with the National Gallery, and it was probably intending to requisition it for some purpose. And Clark obviously immediately saw that if there were concerts here, um, it could actually uh, survive the war and even become some sort of uh, cultural centre. These were enormously popular, and um, they're still very, very well remembered and indeed kind of commemorated by occasional concerts here in the gallery today. A very important point about those concerts is that both he and Mara Hess agreed from the start that they would feature prominently German music to remind people that actually they were, you know, fighting the Nazis and not trying to demonise our all German culture. His first experience in the world of art um, really was as an exhibition organiser. And it's, uh, it was a 1930 Italian art exhibition, that, which was his first real experience of what we now consider to be museum work. But that wasn't museum work in the early 20th century. Institutions like the National Gallery didn't put on exhibitions, and in fact, they didn't lend their pictures to exhibitions. Clark was wild about exhibitions. He absolutely loved them. So now we think of exhibitions as, some people think of them actually as the prime purpose of institutions like the National Gallery, the Victorian Art Museum or the British Museum, they were not at all when Clark was director. But he made them uh, part of the National Gallery during the war. The type of hang that we see today, especially in, in, in these rooms, is the type of hang actually that Clark introduced into the gallery. Some progress had been made in that same direction by, by Charles Holmes. Holmes was not in favour of uh, hanging pictures three or four deep. He'd occasionally um, double hang, of course, as we can see here that we still do today. Previously, in the, in the 19th century, the, the, all the paintings in the gallery um, were on display. They'd all been bought for the nation. And in order to, to um, fit them in, you know, they were very, very densely hung. And Clark um, opened all that up. Uh, when he became director, he immediately started rehanging the paintings, reframing the paintings, uh, moving the paintings into different uh, places where there was different light. He moved all the Dutch pictures downstairs to where there's now the National Café um, because they could got, get better side light, uh, daylight from the side. Everyone who saw that said it was fantastically effective. All of this he did without reference, really, to his own senior curatorial staff. It didn't occur to him that he was kind of trespassing on what they might have considered to be their uh, duty. And he didn't bother to inform them of what he was doing or pretend to consult them. Certainly didn't consult them. There's this uh, interesting letter that he wrote to Berenson when he, shortly after he'd accepted the directorship, where he says, you know, so I'm going to be in charge of a department store. It's, it's a very curious thing to say because actually, um, you know, someone who'd been a manager of a department store would take far more interest in the finances of the organisation than Clark did and try to do much more to get on with um, the senior staff, who Clark, as a kind of arrogant young man, um, had tended um, to ignore. Uh, who've noticed this? <laughs> this? These mosaic decorations by Boris Anrep tell you quite a lot about the National Gallery, actually, because they begin with the, the big mosaic here on the landing, and the trustees had this idea that it would be appropriate to have the, show the muses but Boris Anrep gave all the muses kind of, you know, the faces of famous actresses and so on. So he kind of inserted a popular aspect into what was basically a classical uh, decoration. And then later on in the, the next stage of his decoration, you know, it's, it's um, celebration, it's probably the right word, of um, all sorts of British institutions, plum puddings, cricket, 
things that would mean something to, uh, to the British public. That is Bertrand Russell removing the mask from nature. They're quite witty. Lucian Freud loved this one. Profane love. <laughs> Here's the pig farming. That's what my mother did in the, in the Second World War. So I always think of her when I see the scrubbing of the pigs. I mean, also, these are, these are child-friendly bits of the National Gallery, if you like. You know, I often take children to see these um, before I um, introduce them to Bacchus and Ariadne. You know. So I think it's quite relevant to some of the things that Clark uh, achieved, or hoped to achieve, in the National Gallery, the, the, the ANREP mosaics. Um, this is a painting that uh, Clark bought um, out of the Cook Collection at the, uh, with the help of the Art Fund at the, the very end of the war, at the very end of his directorship. So in 1945, to buy such an extremely Germanic uh, picture as this was, an, I think, a very interesting uh, gesture. Uh, if you look at Clark's acquisitions, you can see that he was someone who had distinct taste for all the different periods of, of European art and had a real understanding of how the National Gallery had, should try to represent you know, European art as widely uh, as possible. So he bought Rembrandt, he bought Sassetta, he bought uh, Benozzo Gozzoli, he, he bought this great portrait of Madame Moitessier by Ang. He bought the great sketch for Hadley Castle by Constable. So he did buy across the whole field and of course you, you get already in the, his work in the National Gallery the sense that he might or an understanding of why he eventually um, becomes a kind of television figure, addressing a really large public about the whole history of uh, European civilization through uh, the visual arts. And whether this was the right direction for Clark to go um, is actually very, I think, quite a difficult and controversial um, question. He's a very, very complicated man, and, um, and his life and work is full of uh, paradoxes which are extremely, well, they're made very clear, I think, by the cover of this book. I mean, <laughs> which I really dis dislike, in fact, this portrait of Clark, but he, he, he looks like a simultaneously someone who's extremely conceited and slightly shy. Um, and, you know, it looks as if he's sort of holding a mask in place and all that's to some extent true. If the National Gallery has become, and I hope will always remain, a place where, which is very easy for the general public to educate itself. And that's something that Clark reinforced tremendously when he was a director.